Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Cynthia Holt, and I'm the Executive Director for the Council of Atlantic University Libraries. Um, and I'd like to welcome you all here today to this webinar, Fair Dealing in Education, at the Student's Perspective. Uh, it's hosted by the Call CBUA Copyright Committee for as part of the 2022 Fair Dealing Week. Um, per past practice, the webinar is being recorded and it the recording and slides will be posted on the call website after the webinar. Um, it should be posted uh, by this evening, uh, but you all receive an email um, notifying you that it is available. Uh, as well, I also ask that you mute yourself during the, uh, the presentation and also turn off your video uh, during the presentation for the benefit of your colleagues in uh, lower bandwidth areas. Um, that way we can optimize the meeting, the webinar experience for everybody. Um, you're quite welcome to turn your video back on and your audio uh, when you ask a question in the Q&A uh, portion of this, of this uh, webinar. Uh, but we just asked during when when Lucy, our, our presenters, Lucy, is presenting that you uh, that you turn them off. Um, with that, I'd like to uh, take this uh, moment to acknowledge that the Council of Atlantic University Libraries um, represents member libraries from across the region, all of whom sit on the unceded and traditional territories of First Peoples. Um, in Newfoundland and Labrador, our libraries sit on the homelands of the Inuit of Nunutsiavut and Inukadavut, and the Inu of Natasinan, the Biotic, and the Mi'kmaq peoples. Uh, in Prince Edward Island and Nova Scotia, we find our friends and colleagues situated on the territory of the Mi'kmaq. And in New Brunswick, libraries are found on the land of the Wulistuuk, uh, Mi'kmaq, and Passamaquoddy peoples. Uh, we at Call CBUA wish to express our sincerest gratitudes, uh, gratitude to the first peoples who share their ancestral homelands with us all. Uh, with that, I'd like to turn things over to Lachlan McLeod, who is the Copyright and Research Data Management Advisor uh, for the Dalhousie University Libraries, and also the Chair of our Call Copyright Committee. Um, and thank you, Lachlan. I have you, I'm turning it over to you. Okay, thanks. Um, so, uh, Lisi Gibo est professeur de droit de la propriété intellectuelle et directrice du Law and Technology Institute de la Schulich School of Law uh, at Dalhousie University, uh, Halifax, Canada. Elle a rejoint la Schulich School of Law en juillet uh, 2017 après avoir passé 20 ans à l'Institut uh, for Information Law de l'Université d'Amsterdam. Elle a étudié le droit civil à l'Université de Montréal, LLB et LLM, et a obtenu en 2002 son doctorat de l'Université d'Amsterdam. Le professeur Guibault est spécialis spécialisé en droit international et comparé de la propriété intellectuelle. Au fil des ans, elle a effectué des recherches pour la Commission européenne, les ministres néerlandais et canadiens, l'UNESCO, l'OMPI et le Conseil de l'Europe. Ses euh, intérêts de recherche généraux concernent euh, l'analyse critique et normative du système de droit d'auteur, examin, euh, examinant l'impact du changement technologique euh, sur euh, l'équilibre des intérêts entre les titulaires de droit et les utilisateurs. Elle a de nombreuses euh, publications sur des sujets liés aux droits d'auteur et aux droits connexes dans la société de l'information, aux licences de contenu ouvert, euh, à la gestion collective des droits, aux limitations et exceptions aux droits d'auteur et aux droits de euh, contrats d'auteur. Um, Lisi Gibo is a professor of intellectual property law and associate director of the Law and Technology Institute at the Schulich School of Law, Dalhousie University in Halifax, Canada. She joined uh, the Schulich School of Law in July 2017 after spending 20 years at the Institute for Information Law uh, of the University of Amsterdam. She studied civil law at the University of Montreal, both her LLB and LLM, and in 22, uh, 2002 received her uh, doctorate from the University of Amsterdam. 
Professor Gibo specialized in international and comparative intellectual property law. Over the years, she has carried out research for the European Commission, Dutch and Canadian uh, ministries, UNESCO, uh, WIPO, and the Council of Europe. Her general research interests revolve around the critical and normative analysis of the copyright system, primarily looking at the impact of technological change on the balance of interest between the rights of owners and the rights of users. She has uh, countless publications on topics relating to copyright and related rights in the information society, such as uh, open content licensing, collective rights management, limitations and exceptions in copyright, and author's contract law. She has also been uh, a very good colleague in terms of uh, helping us quite a bit with uh, copyright uh, advice and stuff here at Dallas University and takes part in our copyright advisory committee. So I'll pass it over to Lucy now. Well, thank you very much, Lachlan. Uh, thank you, merci beaucoup pour l'introduction. Um, I will uh, pursue in English and uh, if anyone has questions in French uh, at the end, I will be, uh, be happy to take them. So, uh, si vous avez des questions à, à la fin de ma présentation, je serai heureuse de les prendre en français également et en, en anglais. So, I shall share my slides um, and I will start. Please note that when I start sharing my slides, I will not be able to see any uh, chat because both my screens will be busy. So, Allow me to start. Um, hopefully you all see my slides and I will be in presenter mode. Uh, yes, is everything okay? Yes. Well, th yeah. oh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction and um, for the opportunity to, to, to speak to you today. Uh, when I was asked about uh, the possibility to, to give the, the webinar today in the Fair Dealing Week, I was asked, so what would you like to talk about? And I did not necessarily want to go into the whole discussion of the uh, York versus Access copyright case. Uh, it's uh, rather technical. It you know, mainly deals with uh, the standard of review of the uh, decisions of the Copyright Board, as well as uh, the mandatory character of the licenses granted by Access Copyright. So I didn't want to go into that. I wanted really to, to bring back the discussion on fair dealing into more day-to-day uh, -day issues that, um, at the that we run across at the university. And I wanted to take the student's perspective because in many ways, I think that the student's perspective is uh, overlooked um, in the different policies uh, put forward by universities. So today, I would like to use the Dalhousie Fair Dealing Policy and Guidelines as example, um, thinking that probably this policy is similar to many other policies in uh, universities across Canada. So hopefully I'm not uh, wrong on that. So let me start uh, here. In the coming few minutes, I will give um, a, a broad overview of what fair dealing is in a nutshell. I will also uh, describe a bit uh, the university copyright policy and guidelines using the Dalhousie example. Then I'll, I'll you know, discuss a bit the, what does that mean in practice with uh, a few issues uh, of particular interests, and then I will look at, you know, what do students do in practice in their, you know, in their career as students, and what does that mean also for, uh, for the fair dealing analysis? And in the end, uh, hopefully there will be time for uh, questions and answers, and I'll be happy to uh, answer all those. So fair dealing, I'd like to, you know, to state what you probably always also already know is that the uh, fair dealing is a defense to copyright infringement claim. So, as the as I explained to my students in the uh, IP course, uh, the fair dealing is a ex post defense. So, a defense that that will be invoked as a result of a copyright infringement claim, and that is to be. Um, contrasted to exceptions that are already uh, in the Act and that, that provide that for 
uh, under certain circumstances described in the act, uh, no um, prior permission is necessary to um, commit the acts or to, to uh, accomplish the acts that are provided in the act. So you have a, a, quite a number of exceptions provided in the Co Canadian Copyright Act, including you know, backup copies, uh, encryption research, uh, uh, library exceptions, quite a, a, a number of library exceptions, and of course, quite a number of educational exceptions. And all those are uh, really laid down in specific language and you know, if you remain within the bounds of those exceptions, you know beforehand that you're good to go. The fair dealing uh, defense is will you know arise once the copyright infringement claim is is um, uh, uh, instituted in court, uh, and will be a defense. So it has been codified in sections 29, 29.1, and 29.2 of the Copyright Act. And um, essentially, it entails two steps. The first step is first to inquire whether the purpose for which a work has been used falls within the enumerated purposes in the Act. And uh, you, you see them on the slide. Uh, section 29 refers to uh, the purposes of research, private study, education, parody or satire. Uh, section 29.1 refers to criticism or review and section 29.2 refers to news reporting. So the first step is to really inquire, is the use that we're dealing with here uh, falling within any of those purposes? If yes, then you go to the second step and that is to determine whether the fair dealing or whether the dealing is fair and uh, the fairness is assessed on the uh, basis of six factors and those six factors were uh, defined through case law and they are the following so the the, the first factor again you uh, ask what the purpose of the dealing is uh, the second the character of the dealing the amount of the dealing the existence of al any alternatives to the dealing the nature of the work and the effect of the dealing on the work. So it may seem paradoxical to um, to ask twice <laughs> what the purpose of the dealing is. Re remember in step one you ask, well, what does uh, the use of this work fall under the general purposes in sections 29, 29, 1 or 29.2? And then again in step two, the first criterion is uh, again looking at the purpose of the dealing. Well, w one is, um, you know, asking what the purpose is in step one is is a more um, objective uh, assessment. You know, does the use broadly um, fall within the purposes of the act? And the second uh, step, looking at the purpose, really uh, asks whether the ex exact, you know, uh, use does that indeed uh, further the purpose or 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 fall uh, specifically within that purpose? So you know, uh, um, dealing with education, um, making class uh, uh, handouts, for example. Well, uh, you have a broader education purpose, and is you know, making such classroom handouts, does that further indeed the purpose? Uh, this is the first step. Um, then the character of the, of the dealing is, you know, how many copies do you make or uh, do you put it up on the website or uh, is it, uh, you know, a, a closed environment? Uh, the character of the dealing really deals in the how uh, are you making that dealing? The amount of the dealing, of course, is uh, is it uh, in line, you know, is the amount of reproductions, for example, uh, is it in line with what you need? Um, 
the other uh, factor, the existence of any alternatives to the dealing, well, you know, would there have been a, any other way to convey your message or to, to achieve the purpose that you're aiming at uh, through another way, through not using the work? And, um, you, you know, this uh, may be yes or no, um, but, uh, you know, when you teach in the educational uh, environment you, you need to to be able to rely on on existing works uh, to to um, well to have the student learn not just public domain uh, works but also uh, more uh, contemporary uh, authors and and knowledge so many times the answer to to the fourth factor will be no uh, there is no alternative to the dealing the nature of the work, um, uh, this criteria asks uh, uh, also in reference to the original work, whether this work um, is or should be br more broadly disseminated. Uh, so it's a factor, I think, that is um, less compelling perhaps at least to me than the other factors because in in certain uh, cases uh, courts have just skipped over it but you know it's part of the analysis and the last one the last factor is the effect of the dealing on the work and um this is indeed you know uh, asking whether um the use of the work will um you know, have an economic impact on the work, for example. It, will it serve as a substitute to, re, to the original work, to the detriment of the original work? And of course, if the answer is yes, then that will weigh um, against a finding of fair dealing. I would say that none of the factors on its own weighs more than the other. It's a combination of all the factors together and a weighing of uh, all the factors that will lead to uh, a conclusion either in favor or against a finding of, of fair dealing. So it's very fact sensitive. It depends a lot on the actual uh, circumstances of each case. I've noticed here the, you know, main relevant cases uh, dealing with fair dealing in the educational context. And you will see here, um, Cases, uh, you know, York University versus Access Copyright is the most recent um, that was decided last year. But we also have uh, two cases in uh, 2017, which were uh, decided at the ap appeal level, one by the Federal Court of Appeal and the other one by the Quebec Court of Appeal. We had one very important decision in 2012 from the Supreme Court, again, uh, access, um, involving access copyrights and uh, uh, Alberta Ministry of Education. And of course, uh, uh, the very, uh, you know, landmark case of the CCH uh, in 2004 has laid the grounds for all the others. And um, I should also highlight that you probably also know this, that the, the Copyright Act was changed or modified in 2012 to include uh, education among the purposes listed in Section 29 in, uh, as a, uh, an allowable purpose for fair dealing. So these are the main relevant cases involving fair dealing in the educational context. And you will see, of course, that all of them basically involved the making of photocopies. And, um, you know, the only one, the CCH case was not necessarily in the educational sector, although it did have, uh, you know, some consideration for the educational sector, but it, it, basically the other four are really involving um, uh, the making of classroom copies or course packs. So what do we learn from the case law? Well, first, that fair dealing is to be assessed in the, in the light of the copyright regime's public interest goals. And the court has repeatedly, especially the Supreme Court, has repeatedly 
uh, stated that the copyright regime's public interest uh, public interest goals are to increase public access to and dissemination of works while also creating the incentives to create new works but it's it's um it's a recognized goal of the copyright regime to increase public access so it must not be uh, author centered it must really uh, aim at um creating a balance between the interest of the authors and the interest of the public. And for that, the court in CCH already in 2004 decide, uh, declared that fair dealing is a user's right. And this, I'm always proud to say that, you know, Canadian Supreme Court is the only one in the world, as far as I know, um, that really has declared the fair dealing and all other exceptions in the Copyright Act to be user's rights. Um, this really allows the weighing of interests on a uh, equal footing, which is uh, very important because the user's right are not uh, subservient to the author's right. They, they should be weighed on an equal footing. And uh, it, you know, it's, it's unique to Canada. And I think uh, it also supports and reinforces this public interest goal of the copyright regime. Uh, you know, copyright is not there only for the authors, but it's all it's uh, a regime that really promotes uh, knowledge in society. So um, I think it, it deserves to be reiterated. Um, what we also learn from the case law is that fair dealing must be assessed from the perspective of the user. And in this, in the educational context, of course, the user is the student. Um, and I like this quote that I've reproduced on the slide. So this is a quote from the York versus Access Copyright case, where the court states that the question in the case involving a university's fair dealing practices is whether those practices actualize the student's right to receive course material for educational purposes in a fair manner, consistent with the underlying balance between users' rights and creators' rights in the act. So you see in, in a capsule, um, you find a reference to the uh, copyright regime's goal of establishing the balance. You uh, also notice the, the reference to uh, fairness and the purpose uh, um, aim is by a, a particular practice and you also see that uh, emphasis is put on the student's right to receive course material so in that uh, quote you you find all of the above so this is the theory a bit um, where does that bring us um, I've reproduced here <laughs> the first uh, paragraphs of the uh, Dalhousie University fair dealing policy, and you see it's it's um, rather general. Um, it states basically that the fair dealing provision in the Copyright Act permits use of copyright protected work without permission from the copyright owner or the payment of copyright royalties. And then uh, it states the two-step test of uh, the fair dealing analysis and it concludes by saying these fair dealing guidelines as i shall show you in a few seconds apply fair dealing in non-profit universities and provide reasonable safeguards for the owners of copyright protected works in accordance with the copyright act and the supreme court decisions so this is the general policy it, it states what it needs to state um, but it's still not specific so looking at the guidelines shortly, it's, it's a very short document, as you will see. So the guidelines start with uh, the three following paragraphs. Well, first of all, the first paragraph I find interesting because it, it really is, uh, determines to whom it is addressed. And you see teachers, instructors, professors and staff members in non-profit uh, non universities may communicate and reproduce in paper or electronic form short excerpts from a copyright protected work for the purposes of research, private study, criticism, review, news reporting, education, satire, and parody. So what I find interesting here is that 
um, you clearly see that it's uh, directed at teachers, instructors, professors, and staff members. You don't see here reference to the students. The second paragraph um, states that copying or communicating short excerpts from a copyright protected work is under this fair dealing policy for the purpose of, again, uh, reference to the purposes, but uh, also specifying that for news reporting and criticism or review, uh, this is conditional to the mention of the source and, if possible, the name of the author. So this is uh, a particularity of the fair dealing in relation to news reporting and criticism or review, in addition to uh, looking at the purpose and the fairness criteria, you also need to mention the source and the name of the author. And this is what the guidelines state, which is conform with the act. And then the guidelines go on to describe what constitutes a short excerpt under the policy. And um, yeah, it refers to the class handout, uh, the posting uh, uh, to a learning uh, environment such as Brightspace or Blackboard, or uh, so you you know short excerpt on on Brightspace or Blackboard, or uh, as part of a course pack. And I follow here. I'm sorry, the the font um, differs because I had to take it from uh, another source. Um, here you see the, diff the, the definition under the, the guidelines of what a short excerpt means. And, and I won't read them uh, because you can refer to them on the website of Dalhousie or in your own home university or educational institution. This is a, a, a description of what is uh, considered to be a short excerpt. And here, this is where the discussion starts to be interesting. Um, and hopefully you'll have questions uh, at the end. So if you took a close look to the policy and the guidelines, you will probably have noticed that it covers mainly the in-person or remote classroom use of printed material. Um, remember, it, it uh, dealt with class uh, handouts, course packs, and um, uh, postings on uh, Brightspace or Blackboard. Uh, it uh, did not really relate to other type of uses in the university or college environment. So it, le it leaves many forms of faculty or student uses unaddressed. Um, one example is the integration of excerpts of works into an uh, open educational resource. Uh, how would that qualify? Um, so, so I'll be... I'll, um, uh, uh, transparent. This is one of the questions that were uh, submitted uh, by one of the participants today, uh, asking, you know, how do how do you reconcile the wish to have uh, uh, affordable educational resources with uh, the fair dealing doctrine? Now, I would say that any time that you include third party or existing works into an open educational resource, you will all the time have to go through the fair dealing analysis. And um, you will need to, first of all, identify the purpose and go through the fairness criteria. And there, in this particular case, I'm not sure that the educational purpose in general would be sufficient to justify integrating excerpts of works into an open educational research uh, resource. I think that you would probably need to think of a purpose like uh, criticism or review. Uh, probably. Um, and why do I say that? It's just um, 
the OER cannot be the vehicle or uh, uh, the uh, opportunity or the occasion of dragging other people's work without a a purpose, uh, so, uh, yeah, separate purpose. Um, we could discuss it at the question period if you want. Um, so that's one example. Uh, and to me, I would view the integration of excerpts of works into an OER um, equivalent to a quotation. You know, it will be fair dealing if it if it would otherwise, uh, you know, um, qualify as uh, criticism or review, and then you give the uh, the source and the name of the author if you have it. Another example that's not covered by the policy of the guidelines is the use of recorded lectures. So, of course, the the Dalhousie website will refer. Uh, people to to the policy on recording lectures, but it doesn't say really what what either the faculty or the student can do with recorded lectures. There would be, in my opinion, um, some grounds to say that certain uses might fall within the education purpose. Um, and, you know, going through the fairness criteria for using recorded lectures. Um, and what about all the other categories of works that are not uh, listed in the policy? So how how are they covered? Well, not explicitly because, you know, using software, film or music is not always uh, used in the classroom context. But certainly fair dealing of such works is also allowed under the Act. So. Uh, you would need to go through the purpose one and the fairness criteria um, for all those works. So depending on, on what type of activity we're dealing with, what type of use, I would think that, you know, uh, there is room for uh, arguing, depending on the facts, of course, that uh, fair dealing could apply to any category of work uh, even if not covered by the policy. Related issues also, those are also uh, inspired from comments uh, of uh, today's participants. Some have asked, so what's the relationship between the fair dealing and the license terms? So if a, if I a license term prohibits any type of reproduction or communication to the public, um, how does that fare with uh, fair dealing? Well, the thing is, this has never been tested in court. And um, I would suspect that a court would weigh users' rights against the freedom of contract and, and um, the uh, copyright protection. So it would be really looking at the facts of the case and um, determining, you know, which right should have precedence and it's not a clear-cut uh, decision and i'm certainly not convinced um, that the outcome is is predetermined uh, but one thing is clear however is that no one in none of the system that i've examined in my research uh, does the fair dealing or an exception justify the circumvention of a technological protection measure. So if you have an ebook or if you're engaging in digital licensing or digital lending, for example, um, exercising a fair dealing right would not be a proper justification to circumvent the, the anti-copy or the, the restriction on access to the work. Um, nowhere, uh, has that been recognized as a valid ground to circumvent? Um, so the interaction between exceptions or fair dealing on one side and license term on the other side is, is certainly not clear and uh, also not in Canada. And unfortunately, we don't have any uh, case law that discusses this issue. Other uh, participants have uh, asked, so what's the institutional liability for students' actions? 
that's also not directly tested in court. Um, and uh, it will also, just like uh, the intersection between fair dealing on contracts, it will be very dependent on the uh, actual facts of, of a case. But I would suggest that determining whether an institution has uh, is liable or not will depend a lot on whether it has knowledge of the illegal acts uh, committed by the students and whether it has control to prevent them. So, um, you know, the best advice uh, that I could give is, you know, the the way to go around this is to have um, a, a notice and notice system, for example. So if if anyone hears uh, uh, of an illegal act, that action be taken down or that that uh, notice be given. So a bit like an ISP, when is an ISP liable for the activities of their users? Well, when they have knowledge of a legal act and when they fail to act upon it and you know whether they have control over it. So knowledge and um, the possibility to control is uh, key in determining whether uh, the institution can be held liable for the actions of their students. It's it sounds very theoretical, perhaps, and um, I agree. It all depends on the facts of each case. And um, yeah, um, it's, I, I would agree, a bit difficult uh, in the abstract to say how best to deal with that, um, except that, um, you can make the students aware that they should not, um, you know, go beyond the bounds of uh, uh, copyright uh, limits. So this brings us to, so what's the student, typical student's use of copyright material? And the, here I wanted to make clear with this slide that, you know, students learn and they will absorb material, they use material to, to read and learn. And uh, so they will make individual copies of works, they mind bodies of works, you know, the text and data mining issues. Uh, they might share documents or, or works with classmates and they might use recorded lectures or other types of recordings or works. That's the learning part. But, and this is also why I wanted to discuss this today. So students also create. So they they produce output and they create, you know, they write papers, they write theses, uh, they create art, artwork, videos, blogs, uh, they make presentations, uh, all of that because, uh, you know, as the saying goes, uh, no one stands uh, on, I mean, uh, alone um, or in isolation when creating and we all stand on the shoulders of giants. Um, this is how we create. So I, I felt when I chose this topic today that most of the uh, fair dealing policies were aimed at at the learning side of the students' experience and at the institution's response to that learning side of the experience, but did not cater much to the creative side of the student's experience because students, especially at the uh, post-secondary uh, level and higher educational level, students create a lot. And of course, they're not employees of the university, so there, there's no direct control uh, uh, of their activity. And they need to be uh, educated as well in um, in the you know uh, doctrines or in the theory behind uh, the fair dealing, but we also need to acknowledge the fact that because they're creating and they're producing new material, maybe their experience with fair dealing is not as linear or or as simple as we think. And well, I took this from the Dalhousie Dal uh, Bright Space. Um, the only notice, as far as I can see, um, that our students at Dal uh, see about copyright is when they access their Brightspace pages with all their courses. Uh, and this disclaimer says the course material in this site has been posted for your personal educational only. Copying course material 
from the site for distribution, uh, meaning uploading material to a commercial third party or public website or otherwise sharing these materials with people who are not part of the class outside of this site may be a violation of the copyright law. If you have questions regarding the use of materials from this site, please contact the instructor course administrator. And that's as far as I could see, but maybe I will be proven wrong. The, the main notice regarding uh, the student's use of material and it's it's very limited it only refers to you know uploading or distributing in wider contexts but it doesn't say much of you know how how is the student supposed to use pre-existing works into their own work you know either in creation of papers or, or other material. So when you think about it, I think that fair dealing can certainly apply in many, many learning activities and also in many creative or creation activities. So for the learning activity, I would suggest that fair dealing for research or private study would be probably the purpose uh, aimed at, and then you would need to look uh, more closely, in, depending on the circumstances and the facts, at whether the actual purpose is, uh, you know, meets the first uh, step of the uh, fairness factor and whether the, the rest of the fairness factor would be met. Um, I also think that for text and data mining, especially text mining, at the current state, probably that fair dealing for research purposes would cover most of it, but it's not entirely certain because, you know, in text mining, there's, you know, massive reproduction taking place. And I don't know if that, because there's no case law at this point on text mining, I don't know if courts would go along with considering that the massive reproduction of, of uh, works for the purposes of mining whether that would fit um, uh, the fairness criteria. Uh, so, you know, it might be a good thing to adopt an express exception in the Copyright Act to allow text mining, but until such time as there is an express exception to cover text mining, um, there is uncertainty, but I would hope that court would be a minimal uh, um, uh, amenable to to considering the research uh, purpose and the, the fairness uh, in the context. So, so as I said, for many learning activities, you know, making uh, copies for your own uh, private study, uh, mining, or or even you know um, other types of uh, a learning absorption of material would probably be covered uh, from this research or private study perspective. In the output or in the creative um, dimension or experience of the students, I would think that the most directly relevant uh, purpose of fair dealing would be criticism or review. Uh, you know, when you write a thesis or a, a paper or you create a, a video and you use other people's uh, existing work, well, you, I think that there's uh, certainly a justification to invoke the, the fair dealing for criticism or review, but the essential condition is that the um, name or the source and the name of the author would be uh, would need to be mentioned. A related issue, and that's also um, inspired from one of the uh, participants' comments, is the question is how, you know, the use of third-party content like quotations or charts or graphs or diagrams and other images in a student paper thesis, can it just be, rely on fair dealing or is um, express permission necessary? And in my opinion, I think that for the reproduction of third party content in a new work, it would need to meet the purpose 
for example, criticism or review, and would need to be uh, within the bounds of the fairness criteria. So reproduction, I think, should be not much of a problem as long as you know the 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 use of the third party content does not go beyond uh, what is necessary. So um, reproduction should be okay. The difficulty might come if if that paper or thesis it gets published by a publisher. Then I, I suspect, uh, it's not suspicion, I'm pretty sure that uh, any publisher will require formal per permission from the rights holders um, of that third party content because there's not a publisher who will rely on the students or the, the writers, the authors, uh, fair dealing use of a work. Um, in publishing the work. So um, I may not be entirely clear here, but um, the publisher will not run the risk of relying only on the fair dealing analysis. And that's because there are too many uh, differences in foreign legislation. And if a publisher puts a, a book on the market in Canada and elsewhere in the world, what can be fair dealing in Canada may not be fair dealing um, in other countries. So might run into trouble in other countries. So for a publisher, never doubt you will need permission. However, if the paper or thesis is deposited only in the institutional re repository, I would think that fair dealing could suffice because there the environment is, uh, uh, I won't say closed, but the um, if a work is deposited in the institutional repository, it's aimed at the local market and essentially, um, at least the argument could be made, and um, I'll leave this for discussion. But my um, my hunch is that for that purpose, uh, fair dealing here could suffice. So the main takeaway of uh, this presentation is that please remember always that fair dealing is a proportionality test. And whether it's um, an institution that acts in the best interest of the students to pr give them um, uh, educational material, or it's the student themselves who uh, use the material, the, the main um, motto is, take only as much of the work as is proportional and necessary to achieve the al allowable purpose. So the, the link to the purpose is very important and the, the proportionality of the use. So if you quote a, 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 an existing author in your paper, for example, only quote as much as you need to, to make your purpose and to, to Oh, to to make your cri criticism or review or to achieve the purpose that you you have uh, in mind with the use of that uh, quotation the more difficult issue is or you know be more circumspect when it comes to disseminating portions of works to the public so disseminating to a larger public will have an impact on the character of the use and its effect on the original work and may tilt the balance against a finding of fair dealing. So if you create a work or if you use a work, um, keep in mind that you know, if you end up disseminating it, it might affect the balance uh, of the fair dealing analysis and it, it may tilt the balance away from a finding of fairness. So thank you very much for your attention. And I, I would like um, to open the floor to um, questions, if anyone has any. Oh, hi there, Lucy. Uh, Amy here. Um, so I, am, I work with Lachlan and Cynthia on call. Um, so I'm happy to kind of help facilitate questions today. I was a little bit late coming in. It's one of those full meeting days. And there's been some really great, um, great um, questions in the chat. Um, so, Allison, um, would alternatives 
to the dealing also referred to, for example, purchasing an electronic version instead of digitizing a previously purchased physical copy? Um, what would be the fair dealing? So fair dealing, um, it's interesting because the fair dealing exceptions of the Copyright Act do not link with uh, the existence of the uh, commercial copy on the market. That's, you know, other exceptions in the Copyright Act do have as condition that you are allowed to, to do, um, to make certain uses of works or to make reproductions only if there is no um, commercial edition or commercial uh, available um, work on the market. But fair dealing is not linked to that. So digitizing. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, again, um, look at the purpose why are why why would there be a need to digitize and if it fits the first purpose then you need to look at you know does it um does it qualify as fair under the six factors so unfortunately there's no cut and dry answer to this one um you know, if you compare uh, to other systems, uh, the digitization of works in Europe was only only started being allowed uh, once the Euro European Commission adopted, uh, you know, their offer works directive, and and later um, in 2019 the uh, the digital uh, single market directive. And before that, uh, cultural heritage institutions were very uh, reluctant to start digitizing en masse. Um, Although there was a case from the European Court of Justice that did say that, you know, if you if you're allowed to show works on a digital device in the premises of the library, then you you should also uh, have the possibility to digitize that work to make it uh, uh, visible on that device. But the court had says, yes, but this does not mean that you should engage in mass digitization. So here in Canada, we don't have case law. This situation has not found its, well, its way to the courts. So um, I can only say, you know, if you have a specific purpose, and if that digitization meets a specific purpose and it meets otherwise the criteria, go ahead. But it does not open the door to mass digitization of a collection. Uh, thanks, Lucy. Um, and and there's uh, some good good chat going on in the in the uh, chat field. Um, a question about Heather. Um, Curious about content students use for the purpose of illustration, which is not a fair dealing purpose. Can this be considered criticism or review, or is it educational if fulfilling an educational purpose? Well, either one. Um, you know, if if they use copyright material in in a classroom presentation, for example. Um, it could certainly qualify, I think, um, under the educational purpose. Uh, the edu it's also interesting because the fair dealing exception or the fair dealing defense in section 29 or um, mainly uh, also does not identify who the actor is, right? So it is a fair dealing to do X, Y for uh, educational purpose, but it doesn't uh, specify which actor is involved. So a student, uh, just as anybody else could certainly say, well, you know, this is, you know, a presentation in class. Uh, it would qualify most probably under the educational purpose. And then you have to look again uh, at the fairness criteria. You know, if it's just one illustration, uh, et cetera, then it would meet the criteria. Great. Um, and we have a question from Cheryl. Um, regarding integrating excerpts of works into an OER, if the instructor has scholarly use permitted in the library license to a journal, would it still be considered a scholarly use to share the figure from a journal? Uh, 
I only see part of that question. Uh, ah, permitted in the library license. Hmm. That's a good that's a good question because um, it, the library license. I don't know if the library license defines what scholarly use. Um, I'm hesitating to say yes because um, you know creating an OER implies um, broader dissemination, and so you can certainly include it. Uh, I think that the the original author or rights owner would probably not have a query with um, with reproducing it in in the context of of a work, but the, would perhaps have more uh, hesitations allowing a broader dissemination. So, again, um, I think the purpose is not at issue. The only thing at issue here is, uh, as I said in, I think my last slide is, um, you know, once you you open it for broader dissemination, it might in, impact the character of the use and the effect on the original work, and therefore may tilt the balance away from a, a finding a fair dealing. So, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. So I see in the text um, for third party materials, quotations in student works, would essays being published in a student or department run non-commercial journal, but openly available, be more open towards a fair dealing analysis defense than when published by a traditional scholarly publisher? Um, not necessarily, um, because it, interestingly, in copyright law, um, you know, what constitutes a communication to the public by telecommunication, for example, um, is not related to the commercial character of that communication to the public. It's, um, you know, whether that communication is made for non-commercial purposes or for commercial purposes, it's still a communication to the public. And and this is to me where I hesitate in saying um, yes or no. Um, the commercial character of the work will be or of the use will be the, the second uh, fairness factor. Uh, so it may or may not. I don't know but it's not clear. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, ah, yes, expanding on the notice, um, um, notice to notice as a control system that a, an institution can have in place. I'm not sure if I understood it correctly. So I was suggesting that um, because because institutions uh, are not necessarily in, in, um, in a situation to have knowledge, of what their students are doing, uh, just like ISPs, for example, and internet service providers. So if you're an institution and you don't necessarily know what your users are doing, the way to compensate that is to, to institute this, this system of notice to notice that, you know, if, if someone comes up, comes forward saying, well, this is my work and it's been used in an illegal or unlawful way, then this will give you the this will trigger the knowledge and you will be able to act upon it and and in canada the system is not a notice and takedown it's the notice and notice system and in, in sections 41.26 i think of the act um where this you know um uh will uh eliminate or reduce uh, the institution's liability for uh, infringement committed by by their users if they take appropriate measures once they gain knowledge of unlawful activities. So uh, it could be, you know, a, a, a page on the website or a link, uh, you know, telling users, you know, if you if you feel that your work is being uh, used improperly, notify us and we'll take measures. And that would be the notice and notice system. So 
instituting a, a page or a system that allows rights owners to um, to give notice might be the way to uh, mitigate uh, the institution's uh, liability for the activities committed by the users. I hope this helps a bit. Are there any other questions? For Lucy today? I know I noticed it's uh, 301 and I thank everyone for being here on the 22nd day of the second month of 2022 at <laughs> 2 p.m. I thought it was a perfect date and the perfect time to have this uh, conversation. Um, so I thank you all for your attention. And uh, if you do have any questions and you feel to um, like reaching out, please do. You have my email address uh, on the slides. I have given my slides to the organizers, um, to Cynthia and Lachlan and Amy, and uh, I'm you know granting permission to dispute them as as you wish. So thank you very much, everyone, for your attention. And. Thank you very much, Lucy, for speaking with us today and being so open and sharing uh, your wisdom and knowledge in this area. Um, as er everybody, I just put the link to the call webinars page in the chat and I, I've already uploaded the slides, but I will be uploading the transcript and recording as soon as uh, they become available. But thank you so much, Lucy. Thank you to, to you all. Thank you. Happy Good Fair one. Dealing Week to everyone. Yes. <laughs> Bye. Bye.